I might make it today. But this I... is a reminder. 59. Uh, but I'm not anywhere near prepared. Uh, so with Facebook. Here we go. I'm reminding you that it's time for eight o'clock coffee. I almost did it. <laughs> I'm reminding you that it's time for eight o'clock coffee. <laughs> pa, 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 pa. Morning, guys. It's time for 8 o'clock coffee. <laughs> it's December the 9th of December. It's, it's Christmas card day. Yay, Christmas card day. Okay, what's going on here? Uh, uh, coming up today. I, 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 all spelled different. Armor all, horse-drawn noodle ring dinglings. I just like the way that sounded, so I did that. Locators of the Lost Ark, the loneliest color, and living in delight. Let me shut the door here. <clears throat> I got some wife's playing music. <laughs> Check my later for links in the description. After the stream is over, it's about stuff I'm passionate about. Alternate health, humor, science, and God and you guys. I don't talk about politics and most of the stuff about God is at the end. So if that brings your noodle, that'll be time to bring the sleigh around. And let me get this fixed. Uh, hey, this uh, scene, this is kind of a weird thing. This scene that you're seeing is out, is my front door. It's kind of interesting. I wanted, to, I like snow backgrounds during the winter, of course, y'all have seen that. Mm -hmm. And uh, before. Got the wrong thing here. Wait a second. And um, this morning I was going to snowing so good out there, man. I wish I could do a stream out there from out there. So what I ended up doing? Oh shoot! I didn't post this. Oh yeah, I did. Um, what I ended up doing was uh, putting my wife's computer out there. Well, she's actually out the front door there. And then I'm streaming my front yard to YouTube, and then I'm playing it on the TV behind me. So, so the background today is my front yard. Um, let's see. I want to get this thing right so I can see any comments that come up. Okay. So I'm running, I'm running just a little bit late. And I'm not real organized today, so... And I'm also streaming to um, a web page, a uh, Facebook page called Nine O'clock. Nine. It's going to be called Eight O'clock Coffee. Or I was thinking about changing it to Morning Coffee. You know, like you're talking to coffee. Yeah. Morning Coffee. Um, since my times keep changing. So if you want to check that out, uh, that's Facebook page Nine O'clock Coffee. It's the same stream as this one is. And eventually what I'm going to do is just stream from that channel and I'll just post it to this side. It's, they got some neat tools on that side that I can use. And let's see, what the day? Well, today's Christmas card day. Christmas cards and the man who is credited with coming up with the concept of a commercial Christmas card, Sir Henry Cole, are celebrated today because he didn't have time to write all his family and friends. Uh, at Christmas time, Cole, a worker at the Public Records Office in London, commissioned artist John Calcutt Horsley to design a card for him, which Horsley did while living at Orston Manor near Torque. Let's check and make sure y'all can hear me. I didn't do my sound check this morning. Sorry about that. Uh, in the United Kingdom, the first card created in 1843 had a picture of a family celebrating Christmas together while drinking while drinking, <laughs> flanked by images of people giving food and clothing to the needy. Below the phrase, 
below the phrase, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New, to you, Happy New Year to you was inscribed. It looked like near to me. Happy and a Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you was inscribed. As the cards worked well for Cole, he had thousands of them printed, which were sold for a shilling each, making them the first mass-produced Christmas cards. In 2001, one of the original cards, which was signed by Cole himself, fetched over $30,000 at auction. It is believed that about a dozen of the original cards survive today. One of them can be viewed at the National Art Library inside the Victoria and Albert Museum, a museum where Henry Cole was the first director. It's also a National Pastry Day and Weary Willie Day. Weary Willie is, uh, you guys that know Whitney the Hobo from WITN, I think he was modeled after, after Weary Willie. He seemed to be real popular in watercolors, uh, paint by number watercolors. Uh, yeah, paint by number watercolors uh, back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, today celebrates Weary Willie, a sad hobo clown that was played by Emmett Kelly, who was born on this day in 1898. Originally a trapeze artist and cartoonist, Kelly performed as a white-faced clown in the 1920s before switching to Weary Willie in the early 1930s. He had come up with a hobo clown idea about a decade before, but it was not until the Great Depression that he was able to persuade management to allow him to fully make the switch. His routine, can that make sense? Because he kind of looks like a, a, a hobo there. And I, I guess hobos weren't all that popular before the Depression, but I, hobos kind of became the symbol of depression, but so I can understand that. Sorry about my sniffling there. His routine as a mel melancholy hobo clown contrasted him with the white-faced slapstick clowns of the period, and he was popular for decades. He performed with Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus from 1942 to 1956, and in some film and Broadway roles. He was at the historic Hartford Circus Fire of July the 6th, 1944, where 167 people died. It is said that this is the one time that he could be seen shredding real tears. World Coral Day is also today, and World Techno Day. And I thought techno would have had something to do with like, technology, but it's music. Techno Day is an annual celebration observed on December the 9th. Let us celebrate the techno music, aka, AKA the Detroit's music. It is the one among the most... It is the... Nah. It is one... The one among the most popular form of music form across the world. That guy didn't. That guy didn't structure that sentence right. Techno music leaves the traces deep within us that touches and brings life by embracing our vibrant nature. It's also Worldwide Candle Lighting Day, which kind of goes. That should have been last week because that was last week of Ad, the first week of Advent. This is the second week of Advent, so you're supposed to light your second candle today. You got two more candles before Christmas. Worldwide Candle Lighting Day is celebrated annually on the second Sunday in December. This day was created by the Compassionate Friends Organization as a way for families and friends to honor the memories of children who have left this world too soon. And that's the end of the days for today. So tomorrow, Monday, is Festival. Festival for the Souls of Dead Whales Day. It's got to be the weirdest name I, I've seen. I looked that one up, I think, and it, it was one of those invented holidays. Green, Green Monday is tomorrow. It's an online shopping day similar to Cyber Monday, and it occurs on the last Monday when there are at least 10 days prior to Christmas, which usually happens to be the second Monday in December. Online shoppers have historically wanted 10, 10 days before they, when they order their gifts and Christmas. Online shoppers have historically wanted 10 days between when they order gifts and Christmas to ensure the gifts arrive in time. The day is like an online version of Super Saturday where shoppers realize there isn't much time left to look for items and they must buy. that, And that they must buy. As many retailers now offer guaranteed two-day shipping, the importance of getting all online shopping done by Green Monday has lessened. eBay came up with the, with the name for the day, which was has been in use since at least 2007. They called it Green Monday because of the extra revenue that the day brought in and because online shopping may be more environmentally friendly than shock, shopping at brick and mortar stores. I think they're reaching there. <laughs> I think the green, the money green is why they were doing it. Not, not the environmentally friendly reason. It has the, become the largest shopping day in December and in 2016 there were $1.6 billion in sales. 
Today is also lager day. It is celebrated today. Most lager is matured or conditioned at a cold temperature and is cool and bottom fermented with a particular yeast. The term lager means storeroom or warehouse in German. The beer originated in the Austrian Empire in the area that is now the Czech Republic. Throughout the medieval period, cold storage or lagering was common in places such as caves and bottom fermenting yeast began being used in the early 15th century. As refrigeration became more prevalent, so did lager. It could be brewed year-round and in more places and could be kept cold until being served. In 1870, Spaten became the first brewery with large-scale refrigerated lagering tanks. I think I like the idea of lager because I like cold, cold beers. Oh, here's my coffee. I'm not going to show it to you. It's too far away. Uh, there are various types of lager. Pale lagers are the most common type of lager beers and are usually light and mild. The brewing process for pale lagers developed in the mid-19th century when pale ale brewing techniques were applied to lagering methods. Some type, types of pale lagers are Hells, Pilsner, Marzen, and Bach. Pilsner is the most drank beer in the world today, and the first company to brew it was Pilsner Urk Urquell. Vienna lager was developed in Vienna in 1841 and is reddish brown or copper colored with a slight malt sweetness and a medium body. Today it is more popular in North America than it is in Europe, and I can understand that because we like our beer cold over here, and they don't. Or over in Europe, they drink it at room temperature. And a common example is Dos Equis Amber. Dark lager was the main, large, main lager made before the 1840s, and today it ranges in color depending on its region or brewing method. Examples include Dunkel, which is the German word for dark, and is between 4.5 and 6% alcohol by volume. Doppelbeck, which is similar to Dunkel, but stronger. And Schwarzbier, which is almost black. It's similar to stout and has a chocolate or licorice tinge flavor. I'm a stout guy. I like stouts. I like uh, Guinness stout, but uh, some of y'all would be mad at me because I like to drink it cold. When I went to see my brother in England back in the 80s and uh, we hit the pubs a lot and it spoiled me on European beer. I couldn't drink American beer when I got back. So. Tuesday's National Noodle Ring Day is dedicated to a type of noodle dish that is made in a ring mold or bunt pan. I never heard of this. So I'm, I, I sent this link to my son so he can make it. He likes making noodle dishes. But we got to get a bunt pan. I don't think we have one. Noodle rings do not appear in many cookbooks today, but there was a time when their recipes were more easily found. A 1936 Pennsylvania Dutch recipe called for noodles to be mixed with flour, eggs, milk, and cheese. That sounds like macaroni and cheese. Flour, eggs, milk, and cheese, and be put in a mold and baked. This is similar to other noodle re ring recipes. Noodle kugel, a Jewish dish, has similar ingredients and is popular during Shabbat and Yom Tov. The center of the mold of a noodle ring is often filled. That's an odd sentence. A 19th, I should read through these things. A 1965 Catholic cookbook recommended serving the dish during Lent and filling the middle hole with creamed fish or vegetables. Another popular filling for the center has been creamed chicken. It is unknown who created the day and when they did so, but with the creation of the day, it is certain the noodle <laughs> Ring will live on. I don't know. It looks pretty dead. I had never seen one. I'm 62. Never heard of one. That's really wild. Can y'all see it snowing back there? It is snowing. It's a little blurry. Uh -oh. This video is not showing up. That's weird. I'll recycle here, see what happens. I hate to think that nothing's going out while I'm doing this. Y'all pause for a second. It shows me broadcasting. All right. 
It's national. I can't do it. I gotta see if it's going out. Facebook. For some reason, my there it goes. I guess everybody's on the internet today. And hit the play button. I'm getting nothing. Well, we'll continue on for a second. Uh, National Dingling Day. This is the, the noodle and the dingling part. The dictionary definition of a dingling is that it refers to a stupid, foolish, or eccentric person. I'm using it in the eccentric, eccentric sense, or one who is crazy. The term came about in the 1930s. And the word is meant to evoke the ringing of a bell. It came from the idea that crazy people hear bells ringing in their head. But this day doesn't really have much to do with that definition, except for that, the, except for that both the definition and the day have to do with ringing. The idea for National Dingling Day came in 1971 when Frankie Howell of the Chicago area was at home with friends. Some husbands and wives were sitting around my house talking and drinking and thinking people ought to be friendlier to one another, he said. They looked up what a dingling meant in the dictionary and they found one of the definitions said it was one who hears bells in his head. Howell decided to create a day where the celebrants would call people they haven't seen in years in order to rekindle old friendships. He wanted to encourage people to be natural and let their guard down. Perhaps the idea of having the, a phone be involved in the day had to do with the fact that it rings like a dingling and is associated with ringing. So. That makes sense. Ding-a-ling day. That means the day you call somebody. Be friendly. Be friendly like. All right, let me get this thing. It's showing the video now, so, I'm, so I see I'm going out. Although it keeps pausing. And as long as Facebook gets it, I guess it's, it's good. <sighs> Sorry. I'm trying to get it so I can see the comments again. Uh, I need a producer. I can't get my daughter to do it. She won't do it. Oh, there we go. Um, perhaps the idea of having a phone be okay. I just did that. Okay, so that makes sense. A dingaling, dingaling. So, what would a ding? ding uh, out of Ocracoke, they call they call the people that come out to visit ding batters. I wonder what that meant. Ding batters. He's a ding batter. In 1972, Howell began placing an advertisement in Chase's calendar of annual events saying December 12th was National Dingaling Day and that a dingaling was a wonderful, friendly, intelligent, loving, responsible, and desirable person. So on that day, you go out there and call somebody a dingaling, and then when they get mad at you, you can tell them what a dingaling is. By 1975, almost 900 people had answered the ad and joined the Dingaling Club. They paid up one dollar to become members and received a bumper sticker which said, "Be a bell ringer." Want to be a Dingaling? Doesn't make sense. Anyway, it made me think of Shia LaBeouf. Actually, he's later on in these movies, and I think that's when I thought of him. Shia kind of, I kind of think of him as a Dingaling. And there's a, a video he did. It's supposed to be a motivational <laughs> video, I think. But so check this video out. It's uh, Shia LaBeouf up above. It's also Gingerbread House Day. Uh, gingerbread, we, the only thing I remember about Gingerbread House Day was that we used to make them for elementary school. And I think that's the last time I've really seen one in real life. Was we would That was like a home project we had to do. We had to bring in our own gingerbread house. Yeah. Looks like it'd be fun to make, but it's so sad when you eat them. It's kind of like when sandcastles get knocked down by oceans. It's National Ambrosia Day. Ambrosia is a name for the food or drink of the gods in Greek mythology, which was said to bring immortality to those who consumed it. Although ambrosia salad probably won't bring immortality like the mythological ambrosia, it is what is celebrated today. Ambrosia is a fruit salad usually made up of pineapple, oranges, miniature marshmallows, and coconut. Coconut? Various other fruits can be used to make it. 
as well as crushed pecans and creams such as whipped cream, sour cream, or yogurt, or that wonderful invention they came out when I was a kid called Cool Whip, <laughs> which I don't even think is really a food. After being made, it is chilled in a refrigerator before being served. It is an American dish. Yeah, it makes sense. It sounds like an American dish. It's an American dish that is thought to have originated in the late 19th century, although it was not first found in print until 1932. It is most popular in the South. I can believe that. They say anything about Jello because all the ambrosias I've had had Jello in it. They didn't say anything about Jello, did they? Or maybe I'm thinking of a different kind of. Ambrosias. Thursday is nat National Cocoa Day. Don't confuse that with National Cacao Day because cocoa and cacao aren't the same thing. Cocoa's processed cacao. It's got all the stuff taken out of it. It's kind of like brown sugar, white sugar, I guess. Uh, it's also Ice Cream Day. Now, why in the world they put Ice Cream Day in December? I have no idea. That's kind of like having the Gaspacho Day in December. It doesn't make any sense to me. And it's National Day of the Horse. National Day of the Horse. Oh, I got it twice. <laughs> it exists to encourage citizens to consider the contributions that horses have made to the economy, character, and history of the United States. Furthermore, it was created to recognize the importance of horses to the security, recreation, and heritage of the country, and because of their continued influence on America through things like film, and their continued existence on open land. The day was created through a Senate resolution in 2004 with the first National Day of the Horse being celebrated that year. Why didn't they just say National Horse Day? National Day of the Horse. I gotta make a little adjustment here, let's see. That's kind of weird. You know, so when I was getting ready to do this thing this morning, I was saying, you know, every, it's snowing. Everybody's going to be on their computer. My boys, when they, they game, they'll be gaming like during the lunch hour or sometimes. And the internet will just get slow because everybody on their lunch break. It, it does. It affects the internet. So I think as the snow goes on, everybody's downloading maps and stuff like that. It's probably really sluggish. Horses have been of great importance to the American continent since even before the founding of the United States. It is believed that horses once roamed the, these lands between 8 and 10,000 years ago before becoming extinct. In the late 15th century, they were reintroduced to the Western Hemisphere into Florida in 1538. The horses that came at this time have come to be known as colonial Spanish horses, and were prevalent in the southeastern and western United States from the 16th century until the mid-19th century when crossbreeding began occurring. The ponies, the horses that got out on the Outer Banks of North Carolina, that fits these, the description of these colonial Spanish horses. That's what they are. They would, uh, From what I understand, they got there from uh, swimming from ships that sunk. They, they swam to shore and then they just kept going. But they haven't been crossbred because they're out there. So they're, they're like Spanish horses, colonial Spanish horses. Around the same time, some horses made their way to the wild, and feral horses called mustangs roamed in herds. Today, there are 33,000 feral horses in the United States. Native Americans acquired horses in the 16th and 17th century. One of the first tribes to get them were the Comanches, followed by the Crow and Blackfoot. Horses were particularly important to Native Americans of the Great Plains. In the 19th century, horses were used by cowboys on ranches and on cattle drives for transporting people in cities for hauling things and for farming. Horse racing also became more widespread in the 19th century with, century with standard bred horses for harness racing coming about and the establishment of thoroughbred horse races. As the 20th century started, horses were being developed for military and agricultural purposes, but as mechanized transportation increased after World War I, horse populations went down. In 1915, there were 20 million horses in the country, by, but by 1959, there were only four and a half million. So that's a one quarter drop. Today, there are 9.2 million horses in the United States. Oh, doubled. That's weird. Huh. Friday's National Salesperson's Day, and that's what it's for, is for salespeople. So when y'all go out shopping on Friday, you give them a bigger tip and wish them a happy National Salesperson's Day. Saturday is Cat Herder's Day. When you're working to organize or control something that is uncontrollable, you may say that the task is like herding cats. It is unclear exactly when the idiom started, 
being used. It may have been inspired by Monty Python's Life of Brian? Nah. And seems to have been have begun being used in the 1980s by the information technology industry. Yeah, I use it a lot. A popular early phrase was managing senior programmers is like herding cats. Herding cats even became the subject of a popular Super Bowl commercial. At work or in life in general, you may feel like you have one thing in line and then something else goes wrong. This is incomparable to two if you had a bunch of cats in front of you. Sometimes you may get one or a few of them to stand where you want them to, but eventually one will run off and you will have to go retrieve it. While you're doing that, another one may go off in another direction. It isn't easy herding cats. The creators of this holiday explained it by saying, if you can say that your job or even your life is like her trying to herd cats, then this day is for you with our sympathy. And that's the rest of the story. Okay, for some reason, I'm still not going out. Or I might be going out and can't tell. So... Take a pause here. Give me a little coffee. Y'all guys doing okay? Is it snowing a lot where you are? I think we got about seven inches already. Maybe more. All right. Herding cats. That made me think of uh, the far side. On the far side, this is the comedy right. The comedy right section, and that, that means not politically right, but correct, comedy correct. Oh, Terry can see me. Thank you, Terry. That helped. <laughs> I can't see myself, so I'm not sure it's going out is my problem. There we go. Uh, so I got a, I started doing some searches on uh, the far side. It's, it's funny, the, the two comic strips I love, which are Far Side and um, Calvin and Hobbes, both those guys stop doing cartoons. I guess they were making so made so much money they just decided to retire, but they were hilarious. Both those guys are hilarious. And I got a video on uh, the guy, Gary Larson, who wrote The Far Side, on how he got his start and how everything went for him. It was kind of, it was a very interesting story. And they go over some of his uh, comics. <laughs> I found myself haw-hawing at some of them. So consequently, that's why I thought it would be a good video for the, for comedy, right? Because I did laugh and it made me laugh. So check that out if you like The Far Side. If you didn't like The Far Side, watch it. It's pretty funny. It's, it's kind of interesting how he caught so much grief because <clears throat> he's, he's kind of got a ding batty, <laughs> ding-a-ling, a ding -a -ling, uh, type of comic strip, I guess. Uh, so what's going on? Well, that was going on. Uh, we're going over to Book of Ruth in church. We started that last, last Sunday and church got canceled today. So I'm kind of bummed out about that. I like the Book of Ruth. If you guys, you guys that don't read the Bible, if you want to read something that's entertaining, um, you can read the Book of Ruth. It's it's like a short story. It's uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, it also made me think about a herd of turtles. We used to say whenever we're leaving, we're off like a herd of turtles because we're always running late, you know, herding like cats. We we're talking about that a while ago, and I, I ran across this uh, from uh, uh, Luann uh, Haddock last week. Uh, it was a uh, article on a, a North Carolina town with no cars. And I never heard of this before. And this is for Horse Day. The name of the town is um, Love Valley. And there's a video on it, but I'm also going to post uh, an article uh, that, that Luann posted. And it was a really interesting, really interesting video. It's kind of like, it's like it's a cowboy town up in the, up in North Carolina mountains. I think it's in the mountains. But anyway, check that out. It is snowing. Well, actually, yeah, it's still snowing. Um, went babysitting yesterday with my son, my grandson, and he's he's about ready to walk. I'm I'm <clears throat> I'm, I'm cheering for him to start walking before Christmas. He's pushing he was pushing his high chair all around last night. We, uh, Sarah and I finally broke down and watched Ex Machina. I always wanted to watch that movie, uh, but it was two things keeping me from doing it. One was that it was kind of a rude movie with some nudity and stuff in it. And the other thing about it was, I don't know, it just kind of scared me. Because it was kind of, I thought of it as a horror movie. I don't like horror movies. But we ended up watching it, and it was pretty eye-opening, uh, and I kind of liked it. But we watched it 
through VidAngel so that we could cut out the bad stuff. And actually, I, I'm I'm ready to watch it, watch it again. I stress uh, movies that uh, have suspense in it for me. I enjoy watching the second time because I'm all on edge the first time, wondering what's going to happen. And let's see. Oh, this little just a little bit of a God stuff. I uh, had a friend who had some. Her husband had a problem, and I texted what to do in prayer, and it worked. So that was the first time I texted something, that, and it worked. I've done it over the phone before, but I've never texted. That was interesting. And that was it. There's an app for that, Gboard. Gboard is an app that you can put on your phone that will allow, you, it, it gives you a Google search button on your keyboard. And if you hit it, you can type in a search and it'll give you the search results and you can stick the search results into whatever you were typing for. So if you're typing a message, it's really cool. You're typing a message, somebody says, uh, how, do you, how do I get to your house? You know, so you go, you hit the Google search, you type in your address it pops up and you can send them instructions on how to get you get to your house. So all I have to do is click on the link. It's pretty cool. So check that out. G board. They blinded me with science. Uh, this has to do with the artificial intelligence. Is that science? I didn't forget to, forgot to tell you what the III for is for. The I, the first I is EYE. Second I is AYE as in yes. And the last I is AI. And because of news that I ran into last week and the ex machina movie that I watched, uh, I just got into some of these links, so I was, thought I'd let you guys check them out. The Turing test, I had forgotten about this. This is a test that to see if a, a robot or artificial intelligence can pass itself off as being human. And basically, we just check, check it out. But basically, it was kind of like the ELISA programs from the 80s, you know, where you, you were talking, you knew you were talking to a computer program, but you were trying to do it you're doing it and you're sitting there going is this this real person or is it really a program and uh, that's basically what the turing test is is to convince you try to convince you that the person you're talking to is a person and not artificial intelligence and it is getting really good it they're getting good at it which is not good really it's kind of interesting about that uh but there's a the turing test what that's all about and then there's a, a video or Twitter bots camping out in your head because a lot of the Twitter things that you see when you're on Twitter, that you read inflammatory stuff, it could be a Twitter bot. It could be some artificial intelligence that you're flaming and having a passionate argument with. That's really interesting. So check that out. The Google Duplex. This is uh, artificial intelligence. In my opinion, it passes the Turing test. It's, it's the, uh, the Google Duplex. It's supposed to be like an assistant like Alexa. That's the thing about saying her name. As soon as you said it, you, she thinks you're talking to her. <laughs> um, but Alexa, cancel. Apparently she thought I was telling her to play something. Um, Google Duplex is supposed to be like an assistant, but it's artificial intelligence. So you can tell your, the Google, Google Duplex to call somebody and make a hair appointment between 10 and 12, which is one of the examples they have in there. And you can just check that video out. It, to me, it's scary. The loneliest color, the color left out of the rainbow. There's a color that is not in the rainbow. That is kind of crazy. Oh, now I can see y'all guys' comments. Hello, Mary Scott and Terry Bell. I said, oh, hey, uh, I love that place. Oh, you've heard of Love Valley. Okay, cool. All right, let me get this thing over here. Apparently, you guys aren't having... Re I don't know how I'm going out because I'm not going in. Oh, you know what it is? I'm hooked up to a weird wireless over here. But I'm going to leave it. Uh, let's see. Me need uh, some more uh, rain here. Oh, Terry's got rain. And 
Mary Scott had said hello. Mary Scott uh, and I went to elementary school together. I was rather mean to her. And she was very nice to forgive me. Appreciate that. No, another believer. So you can't expect less from a believer in Jesus Christ. And I got a ding. I don't know what that's about. That was on my phone. So I can't see it. All right. I got to disconnect from my computer here. It's not going to take that long. Hold on a second. I got to connect to the other wireless. There we go. Let's get that going. All right. The loneliest color, the color left out of the rainbow. I checked that out. All right. Now, in case you missed it, Sarah's movie roundup. She's got a, no, that's not the movie roundup. This is a review on The Little Mermaid, the, the uh, live version. Sarah is fit to be tied with all these Disney movies that are being turned into live versions. She's Lion King, which was her favorite when she was young, is being remade. And said about that. Uh, but she did watch this movie called uh, The Little Mermaid, which I don't think is the Disney version. It's actually based on uh, Hans Christian Andersen's book, The Little Mermaid. But uh, she had an interesting <laughs> interesting review on it, so check that out. Okay, let me get over here one second. I got to do one more thing, because whenever I switch wirelesses, I have to do troubleshooting because my IP address is always wrong. This is for Armor All, and uh, it stars Ty Sheridan, Olivia Cook, Ben Mendelson, TJ Miller, Lena Waith, Simon Pegg, and Mark Rylance. Mark Rylance, I think, is going to be a big star. I think he might already be. I think he did. I think he got uh, an Oscar for Bridge of Spies, Mark Rylance. But he was in this movie, Ready Player One. Okay, that's fixed. Now I get to reload my so I can see what y'all are saying because I don't think it's coming through until like way later. Okay, there we go. Now I'm gonna move this so I can see the. See the comments better there all right uh ready player one they got there's a suit in there that it's very tactile and there's a if you look down into the, what the tech and you can see uh one that's very similar the one in the movie of course isn't real but the one down below is so we can check that out on what the tech but it's a it's a movie um Steven Spielberg, and he does a lot of uh, cameos from his old movies, you know, like uh, Back to the Future and stuff like that. They're all kind of rolled into this movie. It's kind of an interesting movie. Uh, so check that out. Lean Pete. This is National Day. Horse stars. Big Nee. Buscemi. Uh, or Buscemi. Y'all know what I'm talking about. This this movie's an independent movie, so this may be a truly, in case you missed it, type movie. Uh, she, uh, Sarah really loved this movie. And I liked it. And it's not really about the horse, although there's a lot of horses horse in it. So check that movie out. The Horse Whisperer. This, my wife does not like this movie. I haven't seen it for a while. So I don't know if I still like it, really. But it's National Day of the Horse. Robert Redford movie starring, Kristen, starring Robert Redford. Kristen Scott Thomas. Sam, Sarah's favorites, is probably, I told her that he was in it last night, and she, she, her eyes peaked up. Is that the right word? I don't know. Uh, Diane Weist and Scarlett Johansson as a teenager in it. She's a teenager in this movie. And Chris Cooper. And um, Horse Whisperer. Y'all probably seen that one. The War Horse. This is kind of a chick flicky one, although I liked it. And this is for National Day of the Horse. And it has to do with World War I, which, which is kind of interesting, too. And it has some stars in it that weren't exactly famous when they did this, did this movie. Uh, Jeremy Irvin, Peter Mullen, Emily Watson, Niels Aarstrup, David Thewlis, 
Tom Hiddleston, this is before he was famous, and Benedict Cumberbatch, right before he got famous, right before these two guys got f pretty famous in their movies. So check that out, War Horse. Continue streaming. So. No. no, it's not continuing streaming. <laughs> yes, it is continuing streaming. <laughs> I knew I didn't do it this morning. I'm thinking about I think it would have been a good idea not to do it. Uh, it's so weird. So I, I can't tell if I'm really going out or not. It's just odd. Okay. Warhorse. Now we're in the eagle eye. This is I I I Dinglings. Shia LaBeouf, Michelle Monaghan, Rosaria. Rosario Dawson, Michael Chiklis, Anthony Mackey, Billy Bob Thornton. He did a really good job in this one. I think he was the most impressive one in this. But this has to do with artificial intelligence and uh, dinglings. Was there the, uh, something else in there? No, artificial intelligence. Oh, an I. So it's got three. It's got I, and it's got artificial intelligence. It's got dinglings. Then you got Fifth Element. This has got dinglings galore in this movie. It's a science fiction comedy starring Bruce Willis, or dramedy, starring Bruce Willis, Mila jo Jovovic, <laughs> Gary Oldman, and Chris Tucker. How many of you guys seen Chris Tucker in a movie? Turns out he got born again, and he will not do parts that are not edifying or good. So that's kind of interesting, Chris Tucker. More power to him, standing up for it. And Ian Holm, which is one of my favorites. This guy is great at change, at acting. Uh, he, he, whatever he's doing is does not remind me of whatever he's done before. That's what I really love about him. And he plays the um, he plays uh, Bilbo Baggins in the uh, Lord of the Rings series. He plays a priest in this one. Ian Holm. So check that out. Master and Commander. This is for Armor All. You guys know I like this movie because I keep putting it on here whenever I can. And this one's got the armor of the ship. And they say, I. So it's I, I, I. Stars Russell Crowe, Paul Bettany, Billy Boyd, James D Darcy, D apostrophe RC. I wonder if that's what Darcy from Pride and Prejudice's name was supposed to be. James Darcy. Same guy. Same kind of heritage. I guess that's French. D, D apostrophe RC. Chris Larkin and Edward Woodall. Uh, and then Ex Machina, I, 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 starring Domino Gleason, AI for the artificial intelligence. Domino Gleason, Alice, Alicia Vikander, I really like her. Um, I think she did the uh, tomb, latest Tomb Raider movie, but I haven't seen that. And Oscar Isaac, before he was real popular. he was. I think he got his popularity from the Star Wars movies, really. <sighs> I do not know how much rudeness is in this. We watched it through VidAngel, so we don't know. So you guys got to check that out. Be, watch it at your own risk, in other words. What the heck? The best time to work out, and you may be surprised to learn that. Well, I'll just let you watch it. Teflonize your stainless steel cookware. We use stainless steel. We don't use Teflon. Teflon is... Uh, not really good for you, especially when it starts flaking off. So we we don't use Teflon. As a matter of fact, we just we got a, a turkey roaster or roaster for turkey the other day. It was Teflon, but the only reason my wife got that was because it had a steel rat that she was going to put the turkey on inside the Teflon. <laughs> but Teflon's not good, so we use stainless steel. But stainless steel has a tendency to stick when you're cooking eggs, especially things like that. Uh, that's why I like cast iron, which doesn't stick if you do it right. But if you use stainless steel, there's two things that you can do to make it almost like Teflon, very slippery. One of them is involves green onions, and there's a video on how to do, season your stainless steel cookware with green onions. And then there's a salt and coconut oil, coconut oil trick to doing it also. Also in uh, what the hack. Uh, Preventative soup. This is some soup that you can start eating every once in a while to help you keep from getting the cold and the flu. We don't do flu shots. We don't do shots for many reasons. Uh, so we, we try to take other 
other steps. To, you know, I just uh, started getting an itchy nose last night, so I took some uh, Zycam. That really works. How Zycam works. You can get it early enough. Some preventative soup, and then a preventative tonic. This is a tonic that we've used before, and it really works, and it's called Super Tonic. Well, it was originally called Super Tonic by John Christopher. I think Dr. Schultz has kind of taken it over and made it a little bit stronger. This is going to be a video on how to make Dr. Schultz's version of it. <clears throat> Excuse me for coughing. What the tech? 10 everyday uses for Alexa. She's listening. Cancel. <laughs> Check that out. This is pretty interesting stuff you can do with it. And the Tesla suit. I mentioned that above in a video for uh, uh, Ready Player One. This is a Tesla suit, and it's not by Tesla. It's just got that name. It's not the same thing as a car. So check that out. And then under AI, top 10 creepy AI encounters. Artificial encounters. You got to check that out. Uh, let's see. I'll make sure nobody... There we go. I heard a ding. Somebody dinged me. Um... And Mr. Know-It-All, why did they fight like that? You remember they've seen these the guys in the early 1900s, 1800s, and when they're fighting, they're fighting like this, which looks really stupid considering how boxers box today. Well, there's a reason they did that. So watch this. Watch this video on why they fight like that, and you can be a Mr. Know-It-All. Now, the trick to being a Mr. Know-It-All is you can't, you got to uh, pretend the person doesn't know <laughs> I can't do that. I can't tell y'all to be mean like that. I'm sorry. I think I won't get rid of Mr. Know-It-All because all that stuff I read up in front on what the day are actually Mr. Know-It-All things. I've, I discovered that uh, I discovered that during the week because somebody will say something or remind me what day it is. Did you know that? It's, oh, yeah. Like yesterday, my wife was talking about getting a Christmas card. And I said, yeah, tomorrow's Christmas card day. The day that was the day the first Christmas card was invented and started Using my Mr. Know-It-All speech. So basically all those things do is make you, it gives you enough information to be a Mr. Know-It-All anyway. So I think I'm going to drop Mr. Know-It-All. Uh, meditation, the armor of God. The armor of God is used for, and this is the God stuff. We're getting into God stuff. The armor of God, which is is in Ephesians 6, is, is for defense against Satan. And you've got three enemies. You got Satan, you got the world, and you got the flesh. You got the world, the flesh, and the devil. So the armor of God is useful for defending yourself against the devil. So this is Ephesians 6, 11 through 18. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now that verse is just eye-opening if you just pay attention to what it says. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And what that tells us is that whenever we're having a conflict with another person, we're not re it's not really the person that's the problem. The problem is we're wrestling against principalities, powers, and against the rulers of this darkness. So they, they may be under the influence of that, but as long as we have the... the, the uh, idea in our head that we're not wrestling with that, that person, but with the powers behind that person. And you might be under the influence yourself. So recognizing that you're being influenced by the enemy yourself is a good, is, helps out a lot too. So if you can see that it's not people you're having to deal with, but the, 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 the enemy on the other side that are influencing the people, then you can have more compassion towards the person you're talking about. You can be less angry about them, even though they, I mean, there's nothing wrong with being angry if it's a godly angry, anger and you're not, I don't want to get into the anger thing, but scripture says, be angry, but sin not. So being angry is not a sin. It's what you do when you're angry that can be a sin. So we'll do, deal with that later. Maybe next week. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. 
So you got truth and you got the breastplate place breastplate of righteousness. Now what's the what's righteousness? Where the righteousness that comes from God. And if you're born again, you you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So you've got righteousness. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now the gospel is the almost good to almost good almost too good to be true news. <laughs> Any news that's almost too good to be true is the gospel. There's the gospel of the kingdom and there's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then here we're talking about the gospel of peace. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, which we've been talking a lot about here, of course, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now, my wife and I, when we first got married and we, we tried to make ourselves sensitive to the fact that we wrestle not with flesh and blood and all that kind of stuff. So if ever, whenever we, anybody, whether she or me, said something that was mean or inflammatory or anything like that, and we recognized what was going on, we would hold up our, pretend we were holding up our shield like this and go, ding, <laughs> doing that we're knocking away your dart. Pay attention to who's motivating you. So the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now, what they did with the shields is they they would uh, it would be a wood shield. This is the Romans. When you think about armor, you can't think about the medieval armor. This is not what it's talking about. It's talking about the armor that the Romans wore. The Romans had these breastplates. They had shields, and they would take their shield and it the shield of faith, or it was actually just a shield. It was made out of wood, but it had leather all around it. And they would at night they would soak their shields in water. So the next day when they were in battle and a, a fiery dart would hit their shield and stick into it, it was burning, it had water in the leather and it would put out the dart. That's what it means, to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation that protects your mind, helmet of salvation protects your mind, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And this is what Jesus used on the, on the Satan when he was in the wilderness. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. So you got to pray in the spirit. You guys that don't believe in speaking or praying in tongues are going to have a little trouble there because you don't know what that means. But praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So that's, uh, what was that? meditation. It wasn't much meditation on that one, guys. I'm sorry. It was, I might have to drop this one too because I can't think of anything in that meta. <laughs> I have to just change it to meditation. Just regular meditation. Keep the faith, baby. Uh, this is a, a video. Check this out on video on psalming. This is by uh, Tom Loud, a guy I follow. He's pretty good. He's, he knows how to pray for the sick and he's also pretty pretty there on uh, scripture. You know, he's... he's uh, Fundamistic, what I like to call fundamistic. He's fundamental to his scripture verses, knows his Bible. He's not not freewheeling it, not rolling his own doctrines and stuff. He's just reading scripture and believing what it says and doing it. And uh, he's got this thing on psalming, which I was very eye-opening when I first saw it. And I thought it was a great idea just to write your own psalms. And it stirs up your faith. And you, he doesn't really talk about it stirring up your faith in here, but that's what it's doing. And you can see what he did, see what he did with his prayer life with the two examples in it. it. Runs about 17 minutes. You don't mean it. The Garden of Eden. Now, I, I, uh, one of the guys I followed last week is one of the reasons I started thinking about this. The Garden of Eden. We always think of the Garden of Adam was in the Garden of Eden, and that was all that was there. But there was a place called Eden, and he was just in the Garden of Eden, which was in the east part of Eden. And Eden means delight or pleasure, which is kind of interesting because we are we are made to experience pleasure. Where we get in trouble is where when we decide we're going to do it on our own instead of uh, instead of just pressing into God and taking pleasure in Him. We actually take pleasure in, in the other stuff. That's not, that's not good. But the name of the place was pleasure or delight. There was a place called Eden, and in it was a garden. Genesis 2.8, And the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, 
And there he put the man whom he had formed. And there was a river in Eden that used to water the garden. This is in Genesis uh, 2.10. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four river heads. Now where, where is it Eden today? You can't, Eden's not around anymore because of the flood. The flood rearranged the way the world looked. Um, I like to think of the way the world looked before the flood. And this is just me using my imagination, I guess. But I used to I try to think of it as being Middle Earth. <laughs> Lord of the Rings, Middle Earth was before the flood. Uh, it's just just an idea in the back of my head. And I think of the animals that was that were used in, uh, what was it? Narnia before the flood. See, not all the animals, only one kind of each animal was brought on the ark. So there were other kind, there were other kinds of the same, well, that's not the word. There was only one, two, like for instance, two dogs got on the ark. They had that jet, that all the dogs came from those two dogs. All the dogs today came from those two dogs, but there were other dogs. There were other kinds of dogs that didn't make it on the ark. So that's kind of interesting that there would be a whole bunch of different kind of life before that. And you can see that in the, uh, in the archaeological things. Now, free, freewheeling now, let's get back to the subject. Man's job was to, or Adam's job was to tend the garden. This is in Genesis 2.15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and guard it and keep it. Now, what I was thinking about today Well, let me read this one. This is Genesis 128, 128. And God blessed them, granting them certain authority, and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, and subjugate it, putting it under your power, and rule over, dominate the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every living thing that moves upon the earth. Now, this thing started to make me think that Eden covered the whole earth because he was put in the garden to, to guard and keep it. But he was also given authority over the whole earth. So, I don't know. I'm stewing on that one. So, I guess we it's possible we're living in, in Eden. You know, the surface of the earth. Yeah. Repentance. Somebody was using repentance last week. I can't... You know, I'm not, I'm not a religious person, really. Be, uh, and the reason I know I'm not is because when I hear something religious, I go... It just... I don't know, I don't like it. So I start digging to find out what it really means because sometimes I see it being used wrong. And repentance is one of those words. The religious meaning is to stop doing bad and start doing good. Repent. Stop doing bad. Start doing good. There's a good luck with good luck with that. It's not doable. Our nature has to be changed in order for it to be done. And the word the word repent does not mean to stop doing bad and start doing good. It it does mean to change your mind about something. It means to do about face, do a 180. About face is the one I like the most. It's a do, just to do about face, a 180. And most of the time it has to do with just your idea about who God is and whether and how you should be living. Not that you should use it to change the way you're living. It's supposed to be to change your mind about the way you think. I should have had this in here, but you can see this in Acts. A lot of people who get born again don't have to repent. Because they're already looking for God and they're loving God. They just don't know how to accept Jesus as their Savior. So they don't need to repent. That's why a lot of times in Scripture you don't see repentance as being instructions for being saved. You know, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that and gave His only Son that whosoever believes in Him would have eternal life. Doesn't say anything about it. repenting in there because it's implied you have to either repent, change your mind about God and, and, and Jesus and believe in Him, or you're already looking for Him. So repentance just means to change your mind. Sometimes that means that it affects you emotionally, and you can see that in Scripture too, where it talks about the uh, godly repentance versus worldly repentance, which worldly repentance or worldly sorrow, I guess is what Scripture calls it, godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. The sermonette today, I, you know, I told you I wasn't prepared. You can tell. Uh, sorry about that. Sermonette today. I, I, I. More on seeing the spiritual. As I started this last week. This is 1 Samuel 16, 6 through 13, when Samuel was anointing David uh, king. 
when they entered, and this is, uh, he, he went to see uh, Jesse. King, uh, God told Samuel to go to Jesse's house and anoint one of his sons as kings. Problem is, he's got like eight sons. And this is uh, 1 Samuel 16, 6 through 13. When they entered, he looked at Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance. Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. So that tells me to see spiritually, we need to see as God sees, not as man sees. God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. So uh, God gave Samuel instructions not to look on the outer appearance, to, but to look that like God looks, look at the heart. So Jesse's looking at these guys going by and determining whether they're the ones that should be prayed over. Doesn't say anything about the Lord telling him this wasn't, this wasn't the one, in other words. And he said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Next, Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Thus, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are these all the children? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, and be behold, he is tending the sheep. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy. That means red. So... He had red hair and red face. He was ready with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Ramah. That's interesting. The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Now, back, back in that day, the Spirit didn't live in. It would come upon, and sometimes it would leave. And you read that about Saul. The Spirit would come upon Saul, and then it would leave Saul. <clears throat> oh, went the wrong way. Wait a second. Huh. Okay, got something out of order. Under siege and starving. Let's see. This is uh, 2 Kings 7. Last, last week we were going for, uh, 2 Kings 6. And down at the bottom of 2 Kings 6, it talks about Aram sieging Samaria. And y'all know the sieges, they surround the city and they keep people from coming in and going out to keep supplies from coming in and they try to starve out the people that are in the city. That's the way the uh, siege works. And um, it was getting bad. It was getting bad and it got so bad I decided I wasn't going to read. You want to read how bad it is, you guys are going to have to go read it yourself because it was pretty bad. It was 2 Kings 6. Uh, I forgot to put the verses, but it's down near the bottom. And the king got up at, upset at Elisha and, and told his his uh, soldiers would go get him, bring him to him. And then uh, Elisha showed up before they, the soldiers got out there. And, and then Elisha said, Listen to the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow about this time, a measure of fine flour will be sh sold for a shekel. Now, a, sh a shekel is about three times uh, the value of a denarius. And a denarius was a day's wage. So... Uh, uh, a measure of fine flour would be sold for three days' wages. And that's supposed, supposedly pretty cheap. And you, you, compared to what it was mentioning in those verses I didn't read to you, a donkey's head went for 80 shekels. So that's 240 days' worth of wages. So that's almost two-thirds of a year of wages. Of this, When I say wages, I'm talking about a soldier's wage or a common person's wage was about a denarius. Or denarii. <laughs> I can't remember which one's single. They were actually serving. They, they were actually selling bird poop, <laughs> a quarter cab, how much ever that is, for 
five shekels. So that was 15 days worth of wages. So tomorrow about this time, a measure of fine flour will be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. So in that very gate of the city they were in, all this was going to happen, even though donkey heads were selling for 240 denarii or 80 shekels on this day. So I love these stories, especially if you've never read them again. If It would be really nice to forget some of these stories so you can read them and then figure out, now how in the world did that happen? You know, because it, it, there's lots of prophecies and you kind of go, well, now how in the world is that going to happen? And then it happens and you go, oh. <laughs> it reminds me of this story when they were talking about, uh, it was this father and daughter were talking and the father was t telling him about the rat, telling his daughter, his young daughter about the rapture, about how when Jesus comes he doesn't come back to earth. He's up in the clouds. So it's not his first coming. I mean, it's not his second coming because he doesn't sit down, but he calls us up. And the daughter was asking, well, if we're inside, how are we going to go up? Because that, that, that's a good question. How are you going to go up if you're inside? And the father was stumped and he thought, well, maybe I could just get her to you know, pray and ask him, why don't you just ask the Lord? And I think he was... I wasn't there, but I think he was trying to get her just to to uh, to turn to the Lord more for for answers. Uh, but she closed her eyes right there on the spot and asked God how he gets to the roof, <laughs> gets through the ceiling, and then she goes, "Oh!" <laughs> and the father took his wide eyes and says, "What did he say?" And she goes, "He he told me to get told me to tell you that you need to ask him." <laughs> Well, I like the story. But anyway, it's going to be interesting. If you've never heard the story, it's, it's really interesting how this works out. The royal officer on whose hand the king was leaning answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And so this guy's doubting. It doesn't sound like much of a doubt to me, but based on what the prophet said after this, I was going, well, whatever he did, it wasn't right. You know, I used to, I would read something like about uh, uh, Jacob and uh, Esau. And Jacob was a, he was a, a fast talker. He was a swindler. And when I first started reading scripture and I would read <laughs> what Jacob did, I was going, man, that guy's smart. Man, he's, he's got, he's, he's all together. And, I was, and then they, they were talking about how he's, he's called the surplanter. His name means surplanter. And I'm going, I guess my attitude isn't quite right because these guys are, Scripture is saying he's not good. But I'm sitting there going, this is good. Well, it's the same thing here. It doesn't sound this bad to me. Behold, you will see it with your own eyes. But, oh, no, I'm sorry. Behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? Now, he's saying that to the prophet. And the prophet is said, just got through saying, thus saith the Lord. Or, uh, well, this this version of the Bible doesn't say, thus saith the Lord. It says, listen to the word of the Lord. But anytime a, a prophet would say, thus, say, thus saith the Lord, or listen to the word of the Lord, it means what he's getting ready to say is word for word what God has told him to say. So basically, he's doubting what the prophet has said here. And then uh, the prophet says, then he said, behold, you will see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat of it. No, no thus saith the Lord there. He just said that. Now, is that a curse he was pro that was proclaimed on him? I don't know. Got to, oh, shoot, I need to learn to look faster. I get these dings, and I think sometimes I think they're like notifications that I can't see on my computer. I don't, I don't see anything. It's got to be quicker. I'm looking at my phone. Sorry about that. All right, back to the story. So, so... Tomorrow, the one day after this, he says this, all of a sudden they're going to have all this food. Somebody's crying? What's going on? <laughs> Somebody doesn't like what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, let's see. Behold, you will see it with your own eyes. But you, all right, so in 24 hours, there's going to be all kinds of food, and the, the captain of the guard is going to be seeing this food, but he's not going to be able to eat of it. That's going to be kind of interesting. Okay, uh, so next one. Now, there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. 
And they said, this will make a great movie. <laughs> and they said to one another, why do we sit here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, then the famine is in the city and we will die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now, therefore, let us go over to the camp of the Arameans. If they spare us, we will live. And if they kill us, we will but die. That was earlier when you were talking about the artificial intelligence. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, if they spare us, we will live. And if they kill us, we will but die. You know, so they're, they're, they're going, well, why not? We might live. That's the, only, that's the only place we can go. So they arose in twi at twilight to go to the camp of the Arameans. When they came to the outskirts of the camp of the Arameans, behold, there was no one there. There was no one in the camp. For the Lord had called to hear a sound of chariots and a sound of horses and even the sound of a great army so that they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel is hired against us, the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. This is kind of interesting. You know, I was talking about uh, how they were blinded last week and how that blindness probably wasn't blind blindness, but just seeing something that wasn't really there. Well, here they're hearing something that isn't really there. My nose itching. Uh, so they're hearing something that is, that's not really there. Therefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their donkeys, even the camp, just as it was, and fled for their life. So the same time the lepers got up to go turn themselves in to this, these guys is exactly the same time they fled. Twilight. Uh, when the lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they entered one tent and ate and drank and carried from there silver and gold and clothes and went and hid them. And they returned and entered another tent and carried there from, from there also and went and hid them. Then they said to one another, we are not doing right. This day is a day of good news, but we are keeping silent. If we wait until morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. So they came and called to the gatekeepers of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Arameans, and behold, there was no one there, nor the voice of man, only the horses tied and the donkeys tied, and the tents just as they were. They, they left without their horses. They were in such a hurry, they left without their horses. That's crazy. The gatekeepers called and told it within the king's household. Then the king arose in the night and said to his servants, I will now tell you what the Arameans have done to us. <laughs> this guy's a half glass empty, a glass half empty kind of guy. I will now tell you what the Arameans have done to us. They know that we are hungry. Therefore, they have gone from the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, when they come out of the field, we will capture them alive and get into the city. One of his servants said, please let some men take five of the horses which remain, which are left in the city. Why is there only five horses left in the city? Because they've been eating the horses. Behold, they will be in any case like all the multitude of Israel who are left in it. Behold, they will be like, they will be in any case like all the multitude of Israel who have already perished. So let us send and see. They took therefore two chariots with horses and the king sent after the army of the Arameans, saying, Go and see. They went after them to the Jordan, and behold, all the way was full of clothes and equipment which the Arameans had thrown away in their haste. Then the messengers returned and told the king. So the people went out and plundered the camp of the Arameans. Then a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Now the king appointed the royal officer on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate. This is the guy that was doubting. But the people trampled on him at the gate, and he died just as the man of God had said, who spoke when the king came down to him. It happened just as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, Two measures of barley for a shekel and a measure of fine flour for a shekel will be sold tomorrow about this time at the gate of Samaria. Then the royal officer answered the man of God, saying, Now behold, if the king should make windows in heaven, could such a thing be? And he said, Behold, you will see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat of it. And so it happened to him, for the people trampled on him at the gate, and he died. <clears throat> so the seeing there to me, <clears throat> I know, I know uh, the prophets would get a word from the Lord 
but I don't think it was always auditory. Auditory. I think it sometimes it was done in sight, in vision. So the way I'm looking at scripture right now is if it says, thus saith the Lord, then he, he, the prophet actually heard that. But if it's something else, then it's something that he, he either heard it or he saw it in his mind's eye. Now, I don't know if he saw if he saw the uh, guard getting trampled or whatever, but, you know, but. Yeah. Still working on it, but I think the whole key is to believe uh, is for us to. You know, all things are possible to them that believe. A lot of times you see, was well, you hear somebody say, "Is it is it, okay? is it possible that I can pray for this?" And he says, "Well, all things are possible for those that believe." So, if all things are possible for the, them that believe, then in order for something to be possible, you have to believe it's possible. So that's one reason I'm doing this this um, praying or seeing seeing in the spirit because I know that is done, even though I don't do it. I have to believe it's possible, and I have to believe that God wants to use it, just like He wants to use hearing from Him or knowing th knowing things from Him. Uh, I'm not doing a good job explaining it, but psalming, jump starting. Uh, I don't think I mentioned this before on the psalming, But it progresses you from distress to delight. If you're in a distress, that's what Psalms usually do. Psalms, if you read them, you can see that the person is actually in distress at the beginning of the Psalm, especially David's Psalms. And then he, the way he speaks, he speaks truth. And by the time he gets to the end, he's glorifying God and he's lifted himself up. And it was the same, that's what happens when you Psalm. So you progress from distress to delight. And when you're in the... In delight, then your faith is strong. Your faith is stirred up, and that's the that's the time. You know, when I was telling you about when you go out praying for the sick, don't go out with the goal to pray for the sick, and that's your goal. You know, I got to go out and get that these goals done, praying for the sick. You want to go out and love on people. That's there's a guy that teaches you how to do this, and basically that's what he does. He, he takes people out, and he doesn't. He tells them, don't pray for anybody. Just go out and love on people. And then on the last day, they actually do the praying, but. If you start loving on the people, it's kind of like doing the psalming. You end up going from your normal thing to a delight. You get you sitting there loving on people, and they're appreciating it and stuff. You're having a good time. No, sometimes they don't. It's called a person of peace is the way some people call it, finding a person of peace. Uh, last week, went to a restaurant. Uh, What's the name of it? It's a good restaurant. I'll put a link to it. It's a good breakfast restaurant. It's Christian run, run by Christians. And we went there after church. And it was a half an hour wait, so there was a lot of people outside, and there was some, a couple of families with babies, and so I just, you know, go out there and let, started loving all people and started talking to this one couple. <laughs> it was really brisk, very chilly reception. And you just, those kind of people, you just you don't do anything bad, and you just kind of, you know, go about your business, go somewhere else. <clears throat> just love on people. And then when you, you got the rapport going, then you can just, and you're getting ready to leave or something, you can just say, hey, you need prayer for anything? You and it, depending on what it is, it might be something physical. It could be something else. You got to be prepared for it. Just got you got to keep in mind that a lot of times when you go out and pray for the sick, you're you want to see something. You want to see something happen. That's your flesh. Your flesh is the one that wants to see things. You know, Jesus talks about that. What you want to do is love on people, and some of the times that loving means praying for physical ailments, and then and then seeing it. That gives a double blessing because your flesh gets enjoyment too, as your spirit's getting it. But the idea is to love on people and to pray for their needs and to present the gospel, knowing all the world, pray for the sick, heal the sick, cast out demons, preach the kingdom, and in this case, preaching the, 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 uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And well, those are the three main ones. <laughs> My brain's fried. <laughs> Jesus on the streets. And in the bush, Art Thomas, a guy I follow on Facebook who prays for the sick, the one, the one that I really like his technique because he's, he's not sitting there doing the numbers and having to leave his hand on for a certain length of time and stuff like that. He just prays and it's done, just like Jesus did it. This is the best examples I've seen of anybody doing it. It's him. He uh, streamed a, a video of him in Africa where apparently 
I've never, it's, it was really interesting because you, you felt like you were right there. He was at a, uh, in Africa at a orphanage that he supports and they were having a, a program going on and he streamed it. I'm gonna, I got a link to it up there. <clears throat> and then he also prayed for somebody who got well, got, he had a bad knee problem. So it's a miracle there also. <clears throat> also, <clears throat> in Jesus on the Streets, classic reactions to praying for the sick. I, paste, pray, I posted these before also. A lot of times when people get prayed for and they get well, you don't get the reaction you're looking for. You know, like, <clears throat> excuse me a second. <clears throat> you can pray for somebody. Let's say if they got a, uh, let's say their shoulder hurt. Their sh <laughs> I got too much stuff on my desk. Their shoulder hurts, so you pray for their shoulder. And then you say, okay, now move your shoulder around. And they move their shoulder around. This is, does it hurt anymore? And they go, no, oh, feels good. Thanks. So it's like, you, are you sure? Because you think you, your flesh all is, is enmity. Your, your carnal mind's an enmity against God anyway. So it has a hard time believing it when you do that. And then a lot of times you think the person's just lying to you just because they want to be nice or they want to get, get on with their life, you know, or they think you're weird. So a lot of times you'll see these guys say, uh, I'm going to pray for you, but you got to tell me the truth. You know, so you try to get them to, conf a lot of times they say, tell me the truth now. So, but if you pray for the person, the person's shoulder, he goes like that and say, yeah, it feels good. And he says, uh, tell me the truth. He says, well, I am telling you the truth. It feels good. So a lot of times the reaction you get is a perfect, na perfectly natural reaction because it is natural. God heals in such a natural way that a lot of times it's not mind blowing to the person getting healed. It might get be mind blowing later on. It's, it's like, your brain can't wrap your you can't wrap your mind around it, so it it doesn't doesn't affect you emotionally at the time. But it's fun to see the ones where the people go, "What just happened?" And that's what this video is classic. It's called classic reactions, but basically it's really more. Uh, So it's pretty long. Uh, okay, I'm back. Seems like the video went out for a second. Almost done. Under, under the rabbit hole. Locators of the Lost Ark. There's been a lot of reports about where the Ark of the Covenant is over the years. I remember one, so back in the 90s, I remember hearing about one. And Kent Hoven will describe to you what that is that I heard. Uh, back then. Uh, Kent Hoven is a good guy. He's a young earth creationist, does a lot of debating. Um, and then there is a archaeological video of where people think of the ark is now. Because the ark is still around. It's got to be somewhere because what happens, what's next on the agenda is setting up the, the, the temple again. And the temple needs the ark. And it's got to be the original ark. You just can't go out and make an ark. Sound like I'm talking through the rabbit hole? Does it sound sound weird, Terry? <laughs> rabbit hole. Okay. Uh, now, why I got into this? There's an article that was just posted last week about where they think the art might be now. But uh, uh, really, I, said, I wonder what's wrong with my. Oh, no, I'm plugged into my phone. Oh, I lost connection with my Mi Buddy. That might have something to do with it. Oh, well. Keep on going. <laughs> Switch on. <laughs> well, I'll just finish it up later if y'all can't hear me. Um... Is the latest article about where they think the ark might be. Oh, good. Oh, it must be picking up. I know what it is. Since my phone got disconnected, it switched over to my Mevo's microphone. That's what happened. The Mevo's, Mevo's still streaming. Something's wrong with my phone. Dang gone this thing. All right, so his latest article about where it might be, but the, the, the people that are trying to set up the temple, they were they were saying, what are you going to do about the ark? He says, well, we got the ark that's covered. They won't say anything about where it is, but they say it's covered. So somebody knows where the ark is. Okay, that's it.
gosh, almost an hour and a half again. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you that you uh, can we can pray to you not only verbally but uh, through through our imaginations. You can use our imaginations. We uh, teach us to, to pray to you better by just being quiet and listening to you and to to have a spirit of obedience. Help us to walk in the spirit, and not in the flesh. One of the things that got, came to mind, I meant to talk about this, was that you know I always think of my mind. Is having I'm a, I've got a carnal mind and a spiritual mind, and I'll always have a carnal mind and I'll always have a spiritual mind. But Scripture says to renew the mind. So to me, that means eventually your carnal mind is swallowed up by the spiritual mind. Yeah, more on that later. Help us love on each other, Lord, and we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for joining me on 8 o'clock coffee. I can't stop it because... Not connected to my phone. <laughs> uh, all right, see if I can stop it from here. And it says live. It doesn't have a end button. <laughs> uh, uh, this is funny. I can't stop it. <laughs> I guess I'll have to do it by turning off the camera. <laughs> I'll do it by, here we go. Alexa, close the office. Office doesn't support that. Alexa, close the office. Office doesn't support that. Turn the wall. Alexa, turn off the office. There we go.